All right, guys, here we go. We're going to start the show. This is TWIP number 327. All systems are go. Here we go. Welcome back to another episode of TWIP. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. Joining me today to discuss some of the topics that happened this week are Mr. Martin Bailey and Mr. Don Komarechka. Hey, guys, how you doing? Great. Good, thanks. You are good. Wait, wait, hold on. Did we... There he is! And yeah. perfect timing. I'm just introducing everybody. We also have Mr. Aaron Nace on the line, joining from his iPhone of all things. Hey, man. Hey, guys. How's it going? It's going great. How are you feeling? We were just talking about you in our pre-show banter that uh, that you are, uh, you're you're not feeling too well over there. You had a little spill doing things that only younger people should be doing. What, were, <laughs> what, what happened? I was... Uh... Uh, dropping in on a half pipe on my skateboard, <laughs> <laughs> and I broke my ankle. Apparently, ouch! Yeah, uh, you know what? Uh, Here's let me let me give you a little bit of advice. Don't do that. <laughs> I'm going right back in as soon as my ankle heals up. You got one good ankle now, right? You're gonna go break that one. <laughs> I'm gonna try. I'm gonna do what I can anyway. <laughs> All right. Well, welcome, man. I'm glad you made Thanks, it in. Bro. So yeah, I'm amazed. This is working right now. It's. It's, wow. I know. This is this is the miracle of technology. Aaron Nays coming to us, joining the Hangout using his iPhone. Is that a new iPhone or is that the older 4S? Uh, it's a 5. So oh, oh of course. It's a 5. Oh, that's old now. Uh, yeah, it's old school old. now. Yeah, you guys can see my, my boot here on my floor. Ooh. Oh, look at that. Yep. Look at that. It's where the old foot goes now. That's your bionics. Thing. Your bionic mechanism right there. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Anyway, that's why I uh, slightly limited mobility. All right. Well, good. All you need is that phone, man. It's it's 2013. Who, what else do you need? You need a phone and internet. So that's right. Good. That's right. All right, guys. Let's uh, continue with the show. So welcome, you guys. Let, let's start with you, Aaron, and just sort of like bring people up to speed. I mean, I interviewed you a while back on the show, um, which you did a fantastic job there. And I talked about Flurn and all that magic stuff. But just what have you been up to? What's the what's the latest the latest in the world of Aaron Air, or uh, Aaron Nace and the Flurn sort of exploits over there? Uh, besides breaking my ankle. Uh, besides that, yeah. Oh, the, let's talk about the good stuff. <laughs> yeah. um, let's talk about the good stuff. Yeah, things have yes. been really good. Um, we just hired uh, like three new employees. What? And um, kind of like working on our business model a little bit, changing changing what we're doing and trying to like offer a bit more to people. Um, Growing at like a huge, huge rate, really. Like it seems like we, I, I don't know. In the last couple of months, like you hire one really good person, and they kind of like help you boost up a notch, and then it's like, wow, let's just do that a couple more times. That's and, great. Um, it, it just seems like getting the right people, you know, in the door and working with you seems to make a, it's made a really big difference in the last couple of months. So we're really happy about it. So before we move on to the other guys, so you're 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 bringing people on. Just give me, give us a glimpse into that. So you have a studio, you have a brick and mortar studio. Well, you're living the dream. So you got a brick and brick and mortar studio in Chicago. You have Flurn, which is a digital content delivery. You do, sell digital courses and all that cool stuff. Yeah. You're shooting all the time to generate, and you generate content for Flurn and tutorials and all this other stuff. What are these people, these human carbon-based life forms that you're introducing into the mix? <laughs> what are they doing? What do they do? Um, good question. Well, the company is growing a bit, so we need people to like help manage our social media presence, um, customer service representatives, like people who can you know be on call for everyone responding to emails. Because I, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. Um, you so know, you're building and, infrastructure, infra infrastructure to allow you to sort of scale back from the day-to-day -day and do what you want to do, which is, um, I'm guessing, photography, maybe? <laughs> Skateboarding, mostly. But Skateboarding, good. You probably need a little practice at that, but... Yeah. Oh, well, welcome, oh. dude. It's, it's good to have you on the show. This is your first time on This Week in Photo, and it's a pleasure to have you on and honor. So thank, thank you, you for so coming Thank you so much. On. I'm glad I can be here from my iPhone. It's super cool. I love it. I love it. Yep. As your bionics are uh, installed. So thank you for that. Also on the show there is Mr. Don Komarechka coming us coming to us from Canada, our neighbor to the north. Hey, Don. What's going on? Hello, Frederick. Uh, well, I can say that I'm finally, I, I can leave my, my cage now uh, that my book is done. And I've had some chances to get out shooting lately, uh, trying some macro stuff, some, uh, some landscape photography. And I uh, got some workshops coming up. 
uh, in early October, and then that schedule will keep me busy as well. And I love uh, that the teaching stuff. So getting back into that is going to be a lot of fun, uh, freeing as well. So I feel like a huge weight is lifted off my shoulders finally. Well, a huge weight will be lifted off my shoulders when that book shows up in the mail. I got to tell you, I'm waiting on. <laughs> You keep reminding me, uh, and uh, it will be. I'm going to do uh, an on-site press approval on October 1st, and then the uh, the ink hits the paper at that point, and uh, and then the book comes together, and I get it. Uh, well, about two weeks later or so. Cool. So the month of October, you start shipping to the world, and. All, yeah, all yeah. Uh, international people get it first, so you're on that list, uh, Frederick. So that uh, the shipping times will be longer there. So wait, I'm not uh, international. I'm in the United States. Oh, wait, I forgot. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, there is a board. <laughs> <laughs> There's other stuff out there beyond the United States. I forgot about that. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, congratulations, man. It's I'm glad it's all coming together. I'm looking forward to literally get, looking forward to looking at that book. So oh, uh, thanks so much, and and feel free to point out all the grammar mistakes that I missed. I will not do that. I will, <laughs> but what I will do is when I get the book, I'm going to take a picture of it and put it on Google Plus and tell people about it. So, Of course. So. Feel free. All right. Okay. Last but not least there is Mr. Martin Bailey coming to us from Tokyo, Japan. Hey, Martin. What's going on? Good morning. Good evening. It's uh, Everything's great. Thanks. I've just got back from Iceland. I, my uh, my first Iceland tour and workshop, which was amazing. I, I've... I knew I'd fall in love with that place, but it's just spectacular. So really, um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Like, what, what, uh, what's the big thing other than the amazing vistas that that you took away from Iceland? You know, I mean, I think it's um, the the main thing is the obviously the the vistas. That's, I mean, as a, as a nature or a, a landscape and wildlife uh, photographer, I'm, you know, the, the it was just incredible. I came back with. 50 photos that I think I'll probably I'll probably love for the rest of my life, or at least at least most of them. Um, but I I just found it the whole the whole place. It's, it's like um, you walk into there's a, a big like a conference hall, a music hall and conference hall in in Reykjavik, and you walk in there with five or six other people, all with tripods. And nobody stops you. And it's like a guy took a photo of me laying down in in the middle of the room, photographing the roof. And really? nobody nobody comes up and says, "Oh, okay. So what are you doing? Why are you here? You can't use your tripods." And it's just like they're just so relaxed about it. It's, it's a very photography photographer friendly country. Um, nowhere we went. You know, in churches, there's a big church in Reykjavik. Tripod in the middle of the aisle there. Um, obviously, I mean, you, you need to still use your your ethics because sure. you don't want to block it all up and and mess it up for other people. But when there wasn't people trying to get past, and I would just whip out a tripod and put it up there, and and nobody stopped us, and and that was pretty much the same throughout. You know, no matter where we went, it was great. And and I've seen it sounds like almost the it's almost like the polar opposite of what I hear as the the experience in the United Kingdom. What do you, what do you think? Would you say that's fair? I, I haven't shot in the UK for long enough. I mean, not, I, I was there last year for a while, but um, I hear that it's it's pretty nasty at the moment. There's yeah. you know, a, a lot of countries are having a, um, a a lot of problem with you know with regards to photographers being frog marched out of buildings and things like that, and it's it's sad. I mean, and I've got no no um, experience with that because Japan as well is pretty open with photography. They you yeah. know they they don't really Obviously, there are places where you'll be asked not to use a tripod, or, or from the start, you know you can't. But it's it's always pretty open here too. So, mm -hmm. you know, it it'd be interesting for me to find myself in a situation where someone was giving me hassle for being what I am, you know, and just doing the photography because I I might end up. I, I mean, obviously, the best thing to do in those situations is just be calm, be friendly, and and smile your way out of the situation, and that's what I generally try to do in life. See, but, but you're you're a generally nice guy, so I bet people are just like, you know what, he's fine, leave him alone, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. whereas, you know, other people, me, if I go out there feeling like, oh, he might be trying, he's a, you know, you know he's like <laughs> trying to take pictures of our stuff. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing, yeah. sir? What are you doing? Yeah. Is that a camera? Yeah. <laughs> it's in there. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. I'm glad you had that experience. It's it's from what I hear, it's completely different in the United States. You know, well, it is completely different in the United States, and when I hear, it's different in the United Kingdom, as mm -hmm. well, and other places with regard to just photographers being harassed for no yeah, reason yeah. about taking pictures when they're out in public. But yeah. hopefully, that will change. 
And I saw some of your pictures there, Martin, and uh, I gotta say, I'm blown away. Uh, I'm I'm so envious of the opportunities, and you captured them so perfectly. Uh, when you oh, say thanks. you've got 50 great shots, I I know you haven't posted them all yet, but if they're as good as the ones that I've seen, then uh, I I got a book of flight. <laughs> that's cool. That's cool. Oh, that's great. Right. Yeah. All right, guys. Before we continue with the uh, with this episode of this week in photo, I want to give a nod to our amazing sponsor, and that's Shutterstock.com. This is where we enter the ad spot. All right. Let's continue with the news. The first story up that I want to chat with you guys about is about the United States Postal Service, the guys that do the delivery of our mail through hail, sleet, snow, and rain. Um, looks like they're going to have to pay up $685,000 to a sculptor in a copyright infringement case. So essentially, let me, let me read this little blurb to you guys so we can have a basis for the conversation. So it says, this week a court ordered the U.S. Postal Service to pay six hundred eighty-five grand to sculptor Frank Gaylord for the unauthorized use of a photo of his work on a stamp. Gaylord's pictures in question are larger than life-size statues that make up the Korean War Veterans Memorial in Washington, D.C., and photographer and Marine John Ali took the photo from which the stamp was made and recently settled a related copyright, course, uh, copyright case with the, uh, with the 88-year-old sculpture. So, Looking at this, so I, um, I'm assuming you guys looked at this photo. So this is a photo of a uh, you know a bunch of Marines walking through an area with trees in the background. The sculpture, just to describe to the the listeners, the sculpture is is white sort of Marine. They're they're like life size Marines, like half a dozen of them walking in kind of a V formation in this installation. The photographer took a photo of that. Post office bought the photo and then kind of made a solarization, posterization kind of look and made a stamp out of it. So and then they got sued. So Aaron, I'm gonna th <laughs> I'm gonna throw this at you for you're the Photoshop master, so you know exactly how they did this. Um, looking at this, the 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 thing that comes to my mind is, oh man, I thought if it was sitting in public. Like that, I could take a picture of it, and then it was mine. I didn't know that it belonged to somebody. What, what do you think? Is it was it, is this six hundred eighty-five thousand dollars warranted? Uh, what do I think, or what's the law? What do you first? What do you think? We know what the law is because it was settled. So. <laughs> exactly. Uh, yeah, you know, it's hard. I in in some ways, I guess that's to me like derivative art because it's. Yeah. You know, it, it's derivative a couple steps back, actually, because they used, like, a version of a photograph of a sculpture that had been edited. And uh, it, it seems like it, it seems like it's far enough away from the original to where it should, it should have a right to exist on its own. Yeah. However, if, you know, if credit wasn't obtained, like, all the way back as far as it needed to go, um, I, I guess they have a, a case, but that's... You know, that's like, do you have to ask God permission to, like, photograph a tree? Yeah, no, I don't, and I, I think about it, like, when you look at, uh, let's talk, look at the music industry, you know, hip-hop and rap artists, they've been sampling work for years, and at yeah. a certain point, it's no longer the original work, right? And yeah. they're able to use it if it's significantly altered. Looking at the shot, yeah, I can tell where it came from when you show me the original, but it's completely massaged out of that. So I'm, I, that's why I wanted to ask you about this. I mean, where is where is the line between, okay, you've massaged the pixels enough and now it's yours? <laughs> where is that line or is there one? Well, I don't know about the now it's yours. I think yeah. now you have a part of creating it, just like the other person maybe has a part of creating this final thing. But, you know, I don't feel like I can I can take someone else's art and, like, you know, put a sharpie on it and then call it my art now. Right, right. Um, maybe it's a, a collaborative effect at, <laughs> at that rate, but uh, it's kind of like the Shepherd Fairy thing. Remember the Shepherd Fairy yeah. piece? And he with, got in trouble. I mean, he's yeah. still in legal battles over it, and they they used it. You know. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the the photographer who took the original image is suing Shepherd. I think. I don't know if that's over or not, but. Yeah, I don't know. It's weird. It, the the whole thing is is interesting. Now, Don, Don, if this was you, and you know, your the snowflakes that you shoot. I know snowflakes are just one of the gazillions of things that you shoot, but we were talking about that earlier. So, 
someone took one of your like signature snowflakes and said, hey, this would be awesome as a background in this Photoshop composition, and they used it in there, how would you feel about that? Is that would you sue or would you say, oh well, they you know they solarize it or blurred it or whatever, and now it's theirs or it's okay to be part of their artwork? Uh, that's a good question. You know, I, I've I've had some of my images stolen in the past, and uh, you know, I've I've gone sometimes through lawyers. I've had some settlements. Sometimes I just send a takedown notice to people uh, if the the intention is you know um, simplistic, and I can tell that it's innocent and that kind of thing. But in in some cases, uh, like if, if for example, uh, and this this did happen, although I don't know the specifics, but um, somebody had photographed a snowflake. This is not me, uh, and it was used by a, a large retailer as a design on a piece of clothing. Mm. And uh, it was because the silly thing is, all snowflakes are unique. There's no two alike. Mm. So you can easily prove that that was yours, <laughs> and awesome. then there was a huge yeah. settlement that resulted from it. Um, but in this case, when we have uh, when we have a, a, an artist, the sculptor is an artist, uh, and when when you take a picture and somebody pays you to take a picture, uh, you keep the rights to it unless you've signed a contract that says otherwise, right? Yeah. So I'm guessing when this sculptor originally created uh, this piece, uh, he maintained all rights to it. Uh, those rights were not uh, uh, transferred over uh, with the purchase of the artwork. Yeah, and uh, in that case, I, I can relate to this guy. It's still his artwork, and you know he needs to have somebody, uh, you know, call him up and say, "Hey, I want to do this with it. Uh, can I get your permission? What's it going to take?" Yeah, and th this case is um, it went through uh, an appeal process to get to where it is now. Originally, uh, it uh, landed in favor of the uh, uh, the USPS. So, and then it went back through, and now it's against them. The interesting thing is the photographer settled with this guy right away. Uh, the, the amounts are not disclosed, but uh, what was disclosed was that 10% uh, of all of the income from this particular picture uh, would be shared from that point forward. Yeah. And that number was used uh, in conjunction with the USPS when, when that final verdict was landed and, and the amount was decided on. That 10% came in handy to figure out what that number is, uh, which is... Uh, I think the previous, I, I was reading the article on this, that the previous settlement uh, on in this type of case was $5,000. Mm -hmm. So this is like $680,000 higher uh, than any previously decided case. It's just insane. In history. In history. In history. In history. Jeez, wow. So, Martin, I'm curious to get your, your thoughts on this. I mean, the... You know, we, we've talked about the legalities of sort of prior art and using other people's pixels in your pixels and, and working them all together. When you look at this and you look at it and you sort of think about it from a photographer's standpoint, someone, you know, uh, using your work or co-opting your work into theirs, mm -hmm. where do you draw the line? I mean, if you, for example, if you know, one of your snow monkey shots, you know, mm -hmm. snow monkey shots there, you see it, but someone has used it in the background of some other piece, and the foreground is plainly visible, but only you recognize those patterns of pixels in the background as your snow monkeys, because no one else could replicate that. What, what do you do? Do you care? Do you do, you do something? Do you just say, oh, man, that's not, that sucks. What do you, what do, you yeah. do? I, for me, it would totally depend on whether or not they were, it was a commercial piece or not. If they were making money from that, I'd want a part of that. Mm -hmm. If they are doing it for fun and they're just going to throw it on their blog and say, hey, this, I would probably just ask for credits. You know, just just put somewhere that the original piece was, the original work was Martin Bailey's and, and I've done this with it. Just all I'd, all I'd want is a credit for it um, and probably a link back to my website. Mm -hmm. But uh, otherwise, you know, I mean, if, if, they, if it was something that had been done commercially, like you were saying earlier, like it ends up on a T-shirt or something like that, people are making money from it, then I would, I would, take action and, and try and get something um, for the image that had been used. So what's that um, action? Let, let's just talk talk through that a little bit. So you is walk through this use case. So you see that happen and say it's a t-shirt. You know, you're walking mm -hmm. around the streets of Tokyo, you're in Shinjuku, whatever, and you see someone wearing a shirt that has a, a derivative work of yours on there. Mm -hmm. what, do you, what do you do? Do you say, excuse me, sir, where did you yeah. get that t-shirt? <laughs> <laughs> and then you know, and follow them, or what? What do you do? What would be your next steps? Yeah, I, I literally, I, I would probably, if it's just someone that's bought the T-shirt, 
I would probably ask them, you know, like you say, where they got it from and just try to trace it, but that would be difficult. Um, I, I would more probably be better off trying to go back home and, and do a search, a Google search, and try and find something that way. Mm -hmm. um, but, yeah, I mean, it, it, it would be difficult. But once I found the person that had made the T-shirts, again, I mean, it's very possible that it's just some guy that doesn't really know anything about intellectual property. Um, and, I, and had he bought the, the, um, the work for that specific purpose, you know, depending on where he buys it from, he may not have paid a lot of money for it anyway. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I, I, I would probably just try and find how much he should have paid and if, if necessary, go through a lawyer to get that, you know, request over to them. But it, it would all, it really would depend. I mean, I, I would imagine even for a T-shirt, a lot of the time, unless it's gone viral and everybody wants one of these T-shirts, there's probably not a lot of money in it anyway. And yeah. So, I mean, really for me, the, the ones where I would be really trying to seek legal advice and get some... Um, compensation would be if it was used in a magazine or an advertisement. Um, I mean, advertisements are where a lot of if you a, any photographer, if you, you know, if you've priced work, you know that you you know for something like a T-shirt or a cup, a mug, or something like that, you may be talking just a few hundred dollars or a few thousand max. But for an advertisement, you're often talking thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars for a photograph. Yeah. So a it, that would that would be when I would I would start to really think about the you know, taking action because I mean, if any, if if it's only going to result in a payment of a few hundred dollars, it's not really even worth my time going. You know, trying to trying to pursue that. You know, the yeah. the the amount of time it would take for me to even go and see a lawyer and start the conversation would probably cost me in my own time more than a few, more than at the that, price. That at I would. that point, it becomes it's the principle of the thing. Yeah, right? so, yeah. and of and course, I mean. Money. You're not always looking at getting back just the amount that the, the image would have would have cost. Sometimes, you know, you can get damages. You can you can claim more than what the person would have already uh, or initially paid. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, before we move on, uh, one thing that I would be interested in. I mean, this this photograph. It, you know, obviously, it's a the beautiful the one that was used on the stamp is a beautiful photograph, uh, shot in the snow and then put into this beautiful sepia black and white. And this almost looks like a photograph of the scene, and it would be interesting for me to know if if Gaylord actually created the original statues based on a photograph. Because then, how much are we going to pay the guy or or the estate of the guy that shot the original photograph? You know, oh I mean, right, right. Yeah, you know, I mean it, that is that's one thing that I'd love to know. I mean, it may well not be. It may it may well just be a totally fictional piece, obviously based on fact that. These guys were obviously there and fought in the Korean War, um, but it, it almost looks as though this is a photograph of these people coming out of, of a, a woods or something. So it makes me wonder if it was if it was based on another piece of artwork, and you know, and what the the ramifications of that would be if it actually was. And the wow. sculptor was paid uh, more than this settlement to originally create exactly. uh, yeah. the, these uh, this whole display. So I mean, okay. So how much money has been made off of a? Okay, we're, we're making it up, uh, but a photograph that was based uh, that the sculptures were based on that was then photographed and that kind of stuff. Mm. It, it's interesting to see how far back that kind of stuff can go. Where inspiration for a piece of artwork comes from, uh, yeah. where uh, where it becomes a derived piece of art. Yeah, and I, I would throw in there, just to throw another wrench into the whole works, is there are countless pieces of art floating around with with likenesses of, say, the Statue of Liberty, or the Eiffel Tower, or the Golden Gate Bridge. I mean, it goes on and on. Where do you draw the line between, hey, yeah, and someone presumably designed all of those things, right? Yeah. So, you, you know, there's an artist involved. Most most of those you actually need a property release. Um, I know that if you if you commercially use a photograph of the Tokyo skyline, there are buildings um, like Tokyo Tower is one of them. You mm -hmm. you're not supposed to commercially use photographs that that include Tokyo Tower without getting permission to do that. Um, so property releases are as important as um, as model releases in some cases. Uh, but so you know, it really depends on on what you've got included. It's like a, even the Coca-Cola sign. If you shoot a street street photograph that's got a Coca-Cola or sign or something like that in there, those logos are all intellectual property. And and although it's it's not necessarily going to happen for every one of these, but it's it's possible for people like Coca-Cola and Pepsi to to or any uh, company that has a recognizable logo 
they can sue for that stuff. I'm sure. I mean, and, and it, they probably follow the same rule of thumb that you do, Martin. If it's a, if it's just a small infringement and the person has a relatively small bank account, then they're not going to waste their time on it. Right. But if it's an Amazon.com or a Google or Apple or someone that infringes on their mark, then they're going to go after them and get a huge payday. Aaron, what about you? So, Aaron, they if if you know, you have a ton of work out there. Someone co-ops one of your images. I know you did this this 365 day project with all these cool photoshopped images of you, these compositions. You see yourself in someone else's work that they're charging for and making money on. And let's say a lot of money. Let's say they've made so far over a hundred thousand dollars on a piece of work that includes your likeness from one of your works. What do you do? Me? Yeah. Do you care? Do you say, oh, yeah, whatever. I'm I just giving really back. <laughs> you wouldn't care? No, I just, I'd probably want to meet the guy and talk to him, but I, I don't really care that much. I mean, good for him. If he can <laughs> take my work and make more money off it than I did, good for him. Eric, I want you to know that you have a lot of stuff on Flickr, and people are like, oh, okay, I'm going to go get all that stuff now. I <laughs> I probably get two or three emails a week of someone stealing my work, and I really? uh, just gave up caring a long time ago. It's, wow. It's not worth chasing most people down. You know, even if it were a company that, I, I don't know. I mean, if, if Coca-Cola had stolen one of my images, and I'd probably call them up and be like, hey, you guys you want to think about, you know, hiring me to just do actual photo shoot instead of stealing one of my images? But mm -hmm. Yeah. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't have your lawyers call Coca-Cola and say, hey, you know, how much have you made off my image and I want to check or we're going to go to court? That's not really me. I mean, yeah. some people I work with might do that on the company's Some, some of the people that you've hired might do that. <laughs> but to be I, I'm just not the kind of person who's going to track someone down over money like that. I, I don't know. Like, I always created art because I just liked it. And once money starts to get in here, it's just, like, it's messy and I don't like it. So it's... I, I stay away from the money as much as I can because it makes me not like the process of creating art. So to me, like if I can forget about the money, I'll still like the art and then I'll still do the art. But if as soon as I start thinking about how much money I'm going to make off of this, I stop liking the reason why I do it and then I don't like the art anymore. And then the money doesn't, the money doesn't come after the point when, in which you don't like your art anyway because you're yeah. not creating good art. So. <laughs> I just try but that's to a luxury, out. isn't? Isn't that a luxury though? I mean, when you when you think about it, the the photographers that are like out there eating ramen noodles and suffering for their art, and they finally okay, I made this piece, and then and then someone steals it, and it's it's be, and someone else is making money while they're they're trying to feed their kids, and that's an extreme analogy or extreme example. But in that case. Wouldn't wouldn't it be advisable for them to try to get money or get paid? Don, I'll let you take this. Wouldn't it be advisable for someone to be try to like get their money out of that and not say, okay, you know, what, whatever. Yeah, it's it's got to be a a really bad situation where you're struggling, uh, you know, playing the starving artist card, and then you're just seeing people take what you work so hard for and running away with it, not giving you any credit, making money where where you should be. Yeah, and uh, it. it it's not only upsetting, uh, it's illegal. And so there, there is some grounds uh, for people to, to go ahead and, and, uh, and fix that. A lot of times, though, that starving artist can't go and hire a lawyer. You know, there, there's, there's got to be somebody playing for you. And, uh, and I use a company called Image Rights. And, mm. uh, and they take, I think, uh, 50 or 55% uh, plus 50 bucks of, of anything that is settled on and, and worked out. And uh, it usually doesn't go to court, it's settled. And, and I just, I point the fingers, uh, you know, I, I, I point them to, to where all this stuff is happening. And then I don't even worry about it. It's just one of those things that, uh, again, like uh, like many other photographers are, like you don't want to deal with this kind of stuff. This is not where your passion is. Uh, but Image Rights is uh, is is a great bunch of people, and uh, I'll send them the information. And uh, I've uh, I usually get a couple of cases that that are worthwhile um, every uh, every year or so. You know, something that you know really bugs me enough to to send it off to them. And uh, and then I, I wait. If I get to sign a piece of paperwork, then, then I'm happy. But I'd much rather for people to contact me directly and say, hey, I want to license this. And that happens often. I love when that happens. And sometimes I say, yeah, just use it for free. There's no problem. But yeah. 
it, it all depends on on the scenario. I mean, if it's going up on a billboard, then yeah, you know, I want my fair share. Uh, if it's uh, if it's just somebody uh, that wants to use it for some mom and pop shop that wants to put up uh, like a Canadian flag in their in their thing, then that, yeah, that's fine. But you know, maybe I can sell you a print. You know, th there are certain things that that I'd like to help people with, and I I give stuff away uh, depending on who wants it and what's it for, uh, and it makes me feel good. But it makes me feel terrible when people take it without asking. Yeah, it, Martin. Just to just to close this off, it it seems like there's been there's a, I don't know, bifurcation or just sort of separ a huge separation between the photographers on the left that are you know that are like Aaron and Trey Radcliffe that are like you know what whatever you know I'm I'm an artist. And I'm not going to waste my time, my creative energy, hunting down these evildoers that are stealing this. There are more good people in the world. <laughs> yes, I said evildoers. Evildoers. Uh, <laughs> evil like doers. I said evildoers. Yes, yeah, I was doing my best George Bush impression. <laughs> um, but <laughs> but there are the people on the left that that are like, okay, whatever. There are more good people in the world than bad, and the good will outweigh the bad. I'm not going to concentrate and spend my creative energy. And then there are on the right side, the overly, I call them overly litigious photographers that are using the online, not, not like the not like this service that you were talking about, Don, the image right service, but they're using uh, Tin Eye and other services to constantly sniff the internet looking for their works. And if they see a hint of something that was used from one of their images, like three pixels, in a row that match three pixels in a row on one of their images, <laughs> then they litigate. You know, it seems like it's that kind of church and state separation. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Do you do you see that, Martin? And if so, where do you fall in that range? Uh, I I certainly see it, and I uh, I think I probably fall. You know, if if the litigators on are on the left and the the people that you know the Trey Ratcliffs and Aaron's are on the right, then I'm I'm probably just over the center to the wards of the right because I mean I, I like Don was saying I I also people will email me and say I need this I mean I've even provided a guy emailed me recently to provide a chunk of video and that takes a lot of time but I gave it him for free he's a student and he's, he's putting a a video together and he needed some footage of the moon and I've got some really good footage of the moon traversing across the sky I I took the time to to put it on Dropbox for him, find out that particular piece, put it on Dropbox for him, and let it have it for free. And so I mean I, I'm fine with that sort of thing. It, it's uh, and even if, like I said earlier, the, I found someone that was using using the stuff uh, my images commercially, I might still just say, you know what, it's not a big deal. So I'm kind of just to the right of centre probably. Um, but like Don was saying, if someone's using, if someone is obviously taking advantage of me, then as a as a photographer that's trying to pay, you know, tr keep a roof over my head with my images, with my photography and and the peripheral activities of that, then I'm probably going to try. And I've I've just made a note of um, image rights as well. Thanks, Dom. <laughs> I, no uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I I didn't realize that was there. That would make it so much easier to do that. But I'm not going to be. I mean, I've I've found my images all over the place, and it, it annoys me when they take the time to remove the watermark. Um, you know, because I mean, to me, the watermark really is just the—it's uh, marketing for me. It's not protection. I used to use services where they search for, you know, like the—I um, forget the oh, tin eye is good. Uh, the other one that was mentioned there. Um, I used to use those kind of services. I really don't care that much. And now, I mean, I've actually taken the plunge a few, uh, a few years, a few months ago. I'm going to hold this up because uh, I know that. Oh, um, offset. What is it? Yeah. So this is this is a um, a sister company of Shutterstock. Um, they this was released. It's being publicly launched soon. Um, it's been in sort of in beta for a while with invitation based uh, access. But it's basically like it's not Shutterstock where you pay the minimum amount. It's it's like a higher class of of stock photography. But it's not the original, the traditional. Thousands of dollars per image. They've got a. They've got basically two prices. Um, I think it's something like two hundred dollars and five hundred dollars. So I mean, I've already taken the leap to where I'm going to let my images be available for much less than I originally would have done. I was always a traditional fees guy, um, but 
the, I mean, you look at it. Traditional fees. I'm getting paid traditional amounts for images less and less each year. Yeah. So what do you do? I mean, do you do you fight it or do you try and you know? I mean, for me, offset's perfect because it's not two two three dollars an image, and heaven forbid, it's not the Getty Flickr deal where you get like less than a dollar per image. Right. It's 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 wrapped my ego in enough cotton wool that I can handle selling it for. <laughs> For a, a few hundred dollars, it's um, an ego-friendly service. Right? It is, but it's and it's it's a lot less than it ever was. So the the you know the industry's changing. Things are not going to be the same. We're never going to be doing. I think that there's always going to be the place where assignments are going to be, uh, you know, good earners. A photographer gets gets contracted to go off and shoot something that is specific, a specific requirement. That's always going to be there. But I think stock photography has changed to the point where if you can get a few hundred dollars for images, that's fine. And the reason I brought that up was because now I don't even know exactly which company has um, has licensed my images. Hmm. So to me, I could go off and start searching, trawling the internet for work, find something, and then send them an email saying, okay, why haven't you paid for this? And they actually had, through an agency that licensed that image from Offset for them. And I will no longer know now who has legal rights to who's actually bought the rights to I can track it you know and, and if I found something I would probably just get in touch with with the agent at offset now yeah. and find out if it was a legal use but you know it's it's I mean, kind that, of that, all blurring that makes it all the more uh, the, or Aaron's Aaron's approach all the more logical especially if there's stuff out there that you you don't know if it's been licensed or not. Might as well just mm. assume that everyone's honest, you know? <laughs> and you're yeah. going to get paid, and the, the karma will serve the bad people. You know, yeah. hopefully. Yeah. So I don't know. Interesting. You know, we've been talking about this kind of stuff on on this week in photo for geez, what half a decade or so, <laughs> <laughs> and, and it doesn't seem to be coming to a resolution. I have no idea what's going on here. All right, guys. Um, before we continue with the show, I want to just make a quick announcement. Our friends over at Data Robotics, or my friends, our friends, friends of This Week in Photo, contacted me and said that they have some Drobo Minis, one of which I have on my desk that I'm going to do a video about, um, that they want to give away to TWIP listeners. And they said a number, but I'm giving away one at a time. And so I'm going to give away a Drobo Mini sometime within the next couple of weeks and to enter to win that Dribble Mini I'm gonna put a little contest form in the blog post for this episode all you gotta do is you know I think just like something or tweet something or whatever and you'll be entered to win this thing and uh, Data Robotics will ship it directly to you along with that they are kicking in for and I pushed for this by the way so you can thank me later 10% uh, off their Drobo 5D uh, just use the code TWIP9, $50 off a Drobo Mini if you don't think you're going to win one. So you can get 50 bucks off using the code TWIP9, and all this is valid through the end of September. So definitely check that out. And I'm going to push it, depending on when this episode airs, I'm going to have them push it through mid-October-ish. But we'll put the link or the uh, the actual date to, the, uh, to when this is going to be good through in the episode or the blog post for this episode. So definitely check that out. All right, guys, moving on with the show. The next story is about Nikon, and this is really, really interesting. I'm really interested in this camera. So Nikon introduced a camera that they're calling the AW1. I'm assuming AW means all-weather. Uh, but it's their first waterproof, shockproof, interchangeable lens camera. And let me quickly read through this stuff. So... It's the first of its kind from Nikon, or I think it's the first of its kind, period. So it's waterproof. Now this is, when I say the word waterproof, they're saying this is, this camera out of the box with it looking like a camera is waterproof down to 15 meters or almost 50 feet. That means no housing. You just take the camera and you go diving with it <laughs> and it works underwater. It's shockproof um, up to, so you can drop it from up to 2 meters or 6.6 .6 feet high. So taller than I am, you can drop it, it'll be fine. It's freeze-proof down to minus 10 degrees Celsius or 14 degrees Fahrenheit. It's got a built-in GPS. It's got, with a compass, an altimeter, and a depth meter. It's got an action control system, so it's easy to operate when you're underwater or you have gloves on. It's got a 15 frame per second burst mode with continuous AF and 60 frame per second with single um, autofocus. 
and it's got of course 10 or full 1080p video and they've got two rugged lenses that go along with it they've got an 11 to 27 millimeter zoom and a 10 millimeter fixed lens in it the kit itself starts at only 800 bucks and the body plus both lenses is less than a thousand bucks so I'm looking at this thing and I'm like, really? This seems like a much more expensive camera. I mean, maybe the images out of it aren't going to be cool, but <laughs> it seems pretty amazing. I want to go down the line here. So, Martin, let, let's start with you. You spent a lot of time in Arctic environments. I mean, you're, you're snow monkeys and you were just in Iceland, which is not that cold, but you were there. So, would, would this camera fit into your workflow? Do you see yourself throwing this in your bag for those instances where you absolutely positively need to get a, like a portrait of a whale or something like that? Now, I, well, for me, I mean, I, I, uh, I, I'll start by saying that this is a very interesting camera, and I think yeah. it's, it's possibly revolutionary. Um, so, I'm not, I'm not dissing this in any way, but the, for exactly the reasons you just mentioned, that's why I buy Canon's one series bodies and the L lenses, because I can take those things to Antarctica and and get them, you know, I, I've, I've taken waves, a whole wave over the Zodiac with, with two cameras and lenses on my knees, and they're fine. Yes. Um, so, I mean, the, the one series bodies, is that's why I do that. All cameras, um, you know, the, you look in the, in the manual, and it says that they, are, they will work from, from freezing, from zero Celsius to 40 degrees. I've had my 1DS, I think it was, or maybe the 5D Mark II at minus 37, um, which is wow. about minus 36 Fahrenheit. Um, and, I mean, granted, at, that, at those temperatures, the sensor started to freeze up. Towards the end, the end of the, the shoot, I started to get, like, a black mark creeping in, like, like an organic growth on the sensor, and it turns out that it was it was freezing up from the edge and gradually working into the sensor. Jeez. So I mean, they're not. But that was at minus 36, 37, um, and so minus 10. It's and it's an advance over zero, which is mo what most cameras do. But cold is not such a big deal, you know. I mean, if you're in really cold conditions, the old film cameras they used to take the grease out of them because it, it the grease actually became so viscous that it. It would it would stop the camera working. So the the, the pioneering um, Arctic photographers used to take the grease out of the cameras. Um, but yeah, cold is not that big a deal. But this this is a very interesting camera because, like you say, I mean you just just stick the lens on. Um, I mean I'm, I'm assuming you can't actually change lenses at 15 meters under the sea. <laughs> yeah, don't change the lenses underwater. <laughs> that would but be interesting that, if you could do that. <laughs> yeah, I mean you just. But but it's great. I mean, they, I'm, I can see a lot of people clambering for this, um, yeah. and uh, so I think that it's. I'm I'm definitely I'm thinking at the moment that although Canon is still pushing forward, I'm really liking the fact that at the moment Nikon with the, like with the D800 with the super megapixels and and things like this, Nikon at the moment are are really pushing forward, or you know they're they're pushing the envelope as they say. Yeah. So I, I love this stuff because it's going to just make Canon who, I mean, I've got so much investment in, in Canon glass that I, I'm not jumping ship unless Nikon said, Martin, we're going to buy all of your Canon glass and give you everything and more in Nikon stuff, which is highly unlikely. Um, but, and even then I probably wouldn't because I, I prefer, for me, I prefer the ergonomics of my Canon gear because I've been using it for so long. Sure. But, but. The you know this is it's great. I just I just hope that it's one of those things that will give Canon a kick up the butt and make them um, go out and develop something else that maybe kicks this in up the in the butt for a while. Because um, yeah, so they'll leapfrog. They just continue leapfrogging each other all the time, and and it's great to see this sort of thing happening. It's like it's nice. I mean, I I totally agree with you. It's nice to see someone leapfrog in a different direction. And it's not mm. low light sensitivity or more megapixels. We're seeing something. <laughs> Something different, you know. Yeah. And Aaron, yeah. I, you, you, I, I think I saw on your either your Flickr feed or Twitter or something that you were in Hawaii uh, a couple months ago or somewhere. Yeah. Would this have been a camera that you would have like <laughs> taken there, or were you just like having fun hanging out and you know doing luau's and stuff? Mostly luau's. Um, <laughs> well, how big is this thing? Is it digital SLR size? A little smaller? I think it's smaller. It's gonna be smaller. Well, yeah. Like the Sony NEX. Yeah, size. exactly. Okay, well, my whole thing is like, you got two classes, for a person who takes pictures relatively seriously, you got two classes of camera. You got your class camera that you can like keep on your person without a dedicated bag. Yep. So like a 
a Canon G12 or something you, you can shove in a big pocket or whatever. You know what I mean? Yeah. You can keep it on you. It's not the biggest deal in the world. And then you have your full-fledged digital SLR. And unless... Like, unless, if you have something that is not quite either of those, it needs to stand out, like, remarkably, in my opinion, for me to actually carry it with me. Um, because at, at a certain point, if it's if it's big enough, I'll just take my digital SLR, because mm. I already have to take another bag for it anyway, and I'm going to get better pictures out of my, like, you know, fancy digital SLR. Um, if it's small enough, I'll take it with me on these trips, but... You know, it's weird, like, this mirrorless thing that they're doing right now. They're, like, they're not quite small enough to just shove in a pocket, but they're, you know, they're not, like, but they're not, like, robust enough and big enough and have enough features of a digital SLR. So, to me, they're in a weird a weird mid-ground where it's, like, yeah, I would take this on a vacation. And I think for a person who doesn't have, you know, like, <laughs> some of us in this room probably have $10,000 plus in camera and lenses equipment. Yeah, so. yeah. For I've a person got one who doesn't that have more that, than 10, yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, it's like, <laughs> you know, duh. For a person who doesn't already doesn't have tens of thousands of dollars invested in lenses and glass, I think it's an awesome solution. Um, but for me, I, I don't know. It just, it would be pretty. I could see myself taking a digital SLR down to like South America and this thing if I was gonna like shove it underwater and try to like take pictures of dolphins or something. I guess, but. But you weren't, like, when this thing releases, looking at the specs, do you see yourself running out and saying, oh, you know, I got to add this to my bag for those cases when I'm in extreme environments? Um, well, I, so I own maybe six or ten cameras. I, I don't know. The only two that I ever use are my iPhone and my 5D Mark II. Yeah. yeah. I, I own a Sony NEX I own, you know, multiple other digital SLRs and all that other. I just don't ever use them because I have my iPhone with me all the time. And when I want to be serious, I just take my 5D. Now, why? Let me ask you, why? So you have all these cameras. Why do you have all those cameras? What are they for? Are they just are they on a shelf on display so you can impress people when they come over? <laughs> they're in a they're in bags somewhere. They're not. I don't try to impress people with them. They're just. I bought them and I was like, oh, this is cool. I might use this, and I just never did. Yeah. Wow. That's amazing. Don, Don, what do you think about this? So you're you're not necessarily Canada, I don't think we would necessarily consider an extreme environment. You know, maybe British Columbia. <laughs> but <laughs> Well, but, I mean, it, you can go up uh, pretty far north and, and things yeah. do get pretty extreme up there, but I don't think that this camera it, it's it's marketing all of the the small point and shoots they've always promoted, oh, we're freeze proof and we're drop proof. Well, as as Martin said, and the cameras do pretty okay in you know minus thirty degree weather, and 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 they'll, they'll survive. Uh, drop proof? Well, just don't drop your camera. I mean, it, <laughs> it, you shouldn't buy a camera because you intend to be dropping it down a flight of concrete stairs. Right. Um, they and, call them accidents for a reason, right? <laughs> well, yeah, uh, but the the real selling point of this camera is the waterproof design, and and at this price. You can't, like, if you've got a good digital SLR, you can't buy a good waterproof housing for that camera for less than this camera costs. Yeah. So yeah. what happens if for some reason that housing, you know, a piece of dust or a hair got on one of the seals and uh, water floods in and you lose all of your expensive gear inside? Uh, whereas this case, you've got a hopefully decent image quality uh, by the way they're designing it. And uh, if you take uh, good enough care out of it, that that won't happen. But it, even if it does, you're out eight hundred bucks, a thousand bucks, and that sucks. But you're not out, you know, uh, a, a ten thousand dollar camera body or something similar. Mm -hmm. So having this as sort of a secondary option, I think, would be good for a lot of people that might be exploring. That they might be in a scenario where an underwater image is exactly what they need, but they can't afford or they don't want to risk the gear to do it with their uh, their big guns. Uh, but the tiny little dinky point-and-shoot cameras that take terrible pictures underwater won't fit the bill either. I think there is a market for this. It's going to be slim, um, but if, mar uh, if, if the marketing promotes it properly, I think that Nikon can have a winner here. Uh, the Nikon 1 series, I don't know if it's been doing well in all markets, uh, but this particular niche certainly will. And Nikon's no stranger to uh, underwater uh, interchangeable lens cameras. The Nikonos cameras uh, were right. quite popular for a time in the era of film, and they had a great reputation. And uh, hopefully Nikon can leverage that here. Interesting. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know well, what? Can I, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead, Mark. Mean, sorry. I, I'm noticing a lot on my tours that a lot of people now, um, especially the, the older crowd, are shifting to mirrorless cameras because they just don't want to deal with the weight of carrying around so much gear anymore. Um, and I think that that's where this line of this range of cameras. And yeah, I mean, it's not even the older people. I mean, it's it's nice. I when I jump on a plane, I'm usually carrying 18k in my backpack, and that's not, that's not even including my really long lenses. If I need to go somewhere with the long the long glass, I start to get into ridiculous amounts, and it's getting difficult to get it on on planes. Yeah. Um, you know, there there are a lot of reasons why a smaller, lighter kit are, are advantageous now. And if not just because, I mean, every year, just because of every year I get a year older, my bag get, seems to get heavier and heavier. And I, uh, you know, I, I certainly would appreciate being able to travel with lighter gear. The fact is that the, with me at the moment, I'm still, like Aaron was saying, I'm still in the, in the school of thought that, you know, if I want to shoot some images, I'm going to take my DSLR. Um, reason being that for me, most of the time, it means I also want long glass. And this doesn't have that long glass. I mean, I'm talking 600 millimeter and, and longer. Right. So, uh, for you know, for a lot of people, it's still not going to be something that we can do right now. But there are a lot of people that are turning up on my tours as well with Micro Four Thirds. They're often turning up with the Micro Four Thirds camera as their second body, um, which is another good thing. Um, and I, I actually killed my 5D Mark III in Iceland, giving it a bit of a test. It came back to life. I put it into a coma, I guess, for two days. Um, it, did, it did come back to life, but I tried, that, tried out the improved weatherproofing that Canon said it has. They, they, never, they never said it was weatherproof. There's only the one series. But they said it had got better or improved weatherproofing over the 5D Mark II. I decided to try that out, and after a day of walking around in rain and snow in Iceland, it died. Um, mm. This, it wouldn't. You know, So if people need a... A micro four thirds camera as a backup or an alternative camera when they're traveling makes sense to go for something like this if you're going to places like Iceland where you don't you're not no longer going to have to worry about the the weatherproofing. That's what I would think. I mean, I would agree with you. I would think if you're going to Iceland, and yeah, of course you're going to bring what you know, your DSLR, you know, if that's what you use primarily. So you're going to have that. But this seems like it would be for that particular photographer, like. Uh, for 800 bucks, a relatively cheap insurance policy, <laughs> just in yeah, case yeah. all hell breaks loose. You know, you 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 open up your camera bag, there's a block of ice in there, and this thing, you turn it on, and it works. You got charged batteries. You, at least you could come back with a couple of pixels. You know, yeah, at least yeah. at the very least. So I don't know. It's uh, it's it's interesting. So we'll have to take a look at this when it uh, when it actually hits the market. It'll be interesting testing it, but <laughs> we'll see. We'll see how that goes. All right, guys. Um, let's move on real quickly to this last story, and this is about a, U a USA Today photographer Her name's Debbie Wong. Um, was caught substituting an image uh, to mark a historic at bat shot. So here's the blurb. So USA Today photographer. Uh, Debbie Wong missed a shot of Ichiro Suzuki's historic 4,000th base hit back in August. So she substituted another shot from another day of one of Suzuki's swings in its place. And of course, the photographer community cried out and said, hey, there's a bunch of shots of this guy shooting and your shot doesn't match those. What's the deal? So the, the reason, apparently allegedly, that she missed the shot was that she was chimping. And chimping, for those who don't know, is when you take a shot or a series of shots, you look down at your LCD and you kind of review what you did, thus missing the important <laughs> shot. So that's apparently what this USA Today photographer did. Um, Don, let, let's start with you on this. When you, when you looked at this story, what was your first reaction? Were you like, well, good, I'm glad they caught her, or... In, as in my case, I was looking at this. And I was like, "Wow, I wonder how many people got away with this <laughs> that we didn't even notice." What do you What do you think? Well, no one wins in this scenario, so it, it, it's hard to to sort of take sides in a way. I mean, it sucks that she missed the shot, but it was kind of her fault. If she knew that that moment was coming, you know, that she hadn't got it, that the crowds around would have like say, and I haven't watched the game, but let let's say Suzuki took a swing and he missed. That should be evident without reviewing your images, you know. And, and so you know that that moment is just about to come again. Why are you taking your eye off the ball, quite literally? Yeah. And and so, I I I want to feel bad for this person, but 
I, I have a hard time. You know, you were in the moment and you missed the shot. Uh, if she had owned up to it, if she had said, okay, well, you know what, I missed the shot. Uh, you know, it, it sucks, but let's just move on. Then, you know what, she might still have a job because mm -hmm. she was fired over this event. And uh, it was probably due to the fact that she tried to fake her way through it and pretend that nothing was wrong. It was a poker bluff. It was a poker bluff. Like I could, I I just imagine in my own demented mind's eye that <laughs> her boss was saying, "Come back with a sh this is the game that he's gonna get his four thousandth base hit. Come back with that shot or don't come back at all." <laughs> so, so she's like, "Well, I missed the shot because I was chimping. He'll never know if I put this shot in there, and I'll still have a job. And if they catch me, then you know I lost my job anyway." Aaron, when you when you saw this, when you see, when you hear this story. What what's your first reaction? Uh, I agree totally with Don. Really, I uh, you know accidents happen. You you miss things, but like, I really think it was responsibility. To, you know, like the the, sh the wrong for for lying. In my opinion, I mean, like, you know, like sometimes you miss you miss the shot. That just happens. But um, you know, being lying about it, I. Is really just never the right, never the right policy. So, um, I don't, I don't know. But it, it also causes me to like kind of think about the world we live in and the pressure that photographers are under and all that. You know, like now her getting fired, her thinking, her believing that she has to lie her way out of this rather than just be like, look, I missed it. You know, like that's, that to me is kind of interesting too. Like what we have been like built up to be. Like people forget that we're people. Mm -hmm. operating these cameras, you know, like we're fallible just like everyone else. Like you get bad weather, uh, people get sick, people break their ankle, like you miss the <laughs> shot. Like what am I, a robot, you know? Right. Like you if someone else was there they could have missed the shot too. So um yeah, I mean technically she didn't do the job to the best of her like abilities or maybe the, her expectations, but people mess up at their jobs all the time. I do it every single day. Um I just it would have been nice, you know, right, if uh, if if we lived in a society where it wasn't such a bad thing to admit when you're wrong every now and then. Yeah, yeah, and I I, I agree with that, but then I also, that, so you're giving her the benefit of the doubt. So the other side of it is maybe there wasn't a whole lot of pressure on her and she just wanted to, you know, show that she got a better shot than the guy next to her. So who right. knows? We won't know in, unless we talk with Miss Debbie Wong and find out what the real what was going through her mind. And I doubt if that's going to happen anytime soon. So I don't know, Martin. Well, she Martin, doesn't have much to do now, so she might have the time. <laughs> Maybe I'll be able to get her. Hey, Debbie, if you're listening, we'll we welcome you to come on this week in photo and explain your position. So. <laughs> Martin, what do you, what do you think, Debbie? What, did Debbie do the? Well, obviously she did the wrong thing because she's now you know not at USA Today anymore. But if you were in this position, I know you would have done the right thing. But uh, what what do you say about the pressures, like Aaron was saying, that are on photographers today to come away with the shot? I I agree, and and you know, in that there is a lot of pressure, but I think pressure in is is often a good thing if you. You know, you know that you've got to come back with that shot. You don't chimp at that point. You you know your gear. You you set it all up. You've got your exposure locked in. You know that when it happens, you're going to be ready. And you just you just concentrate and, and do the job. Um, I but it you know I mean it is unfortunate, and you've got to feel for the woman because everybody like like Aaron was saying that everybody misses shots. It's just that you've got to really really try as a professional to not miss the shot. Right. It's like you know you're told to come back with a with a photo of or even if you're not told to you know it's a big deal. I I personally even if it wasn't my job if I was sitting there I would want a shot of Ichiro hitting his 4,000th hit, you know and I and it's historical and yeah. I would kick myself never mind my boss kicking me if I didn't get that shot. So you know I mean it, it's I think it's all it all comes down to who how we who we are as people and um. But by the way, did do you know why we say chimping when you know with regards to looking at the back of the camera? Mm, I'm have I'm, I I think it has something to do with chimps, but no, I don't know exactly. <laughs> it's, it's imagine a group of photographers all standing around looking at the back of their cameras, going ooh 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 ooh. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> that's, I, that's apparently where chimping comes from. Hey, but, um, you know I chimp. Um, I you know I'm everybody chimps. Johnson and I chimp. I'm sorry, yeah. I like it. <laughs> I well I I mean I'm a I'm a pro chimper. I mean, if, why? Why would you? Why would you're you? You're a master have, chimper. Is that what you're saying? 
I, why would you have all the technology to be able to check the exposure and you know to be able to see right there and then whether or not you've got the image? The, the problem is is the timing. You just don't chimp when someone's on base and he's right. about to, he's a possibility that he's going to hit his four hundred four thousandth hit. So I mean, when I'm when I'm out doing my nature work, especially wildlife, where the the timing is so critical, if there's something possibly going to happen, I've got I make sure I've got everything ready and I'm just waiting to capture the moment. But then when there's downtime, you can take a moment to look at your look at your images, and that can help you to be to feel better about leaving a location. You know, if you if you can see on the back of the camera that you've nailed the shot that you were there to get. You can then, you know, leave early. You can do what you want. I often don't because I'm thinking that there's always a better shot five minutes down the road, and yeah. and sticking with a location or a subject for longer often results in better images. Yeah. Um, but you know, it's I, I think that chimping is not necessarily a bad thing. You've just got to make sure that you're doing it at the right time. And and you know, I've I've missed shots because I've been chimping, but. Old school, uh, old school chimping was looking to make sure that you had enough exposures left on your 36 exposure roll. That was it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was yeah. like, can yeah. I can I shoot the rest of this event with three shots? You know, that was it. That was it. <laughs> yeah. Now things are different. All right, guys, let's uh, let's close out the show. Uh, our last sponsor, and I want to welcome them with a with a huge thank you for coming on to this week in photo family is Picture Life. Uh, they're our newest sponsor or the newest sponsor to this week in photo. Post production and search. As if I need to do that. All right, <laughs> it's time for some listener Q and A. This is the segment where we answer questions that have been at the top of some of our listeners' minds. The first question, actually, our only question for the day is from Michael, and he says, "Do you generally expect your clients to place a credit to you if they post commissioned work on social media?" I recently did portraits for a family, and they posted one of the photos on Facebook and are getting a lot of positive buzz, more than 100 likes and climbing. They didn't put any credit to me as a photographer. Will I be breaching etiquette to ask them to credit me for the photo? And the follow-up question, would your answer change if it was a paid versus a free gig? Aaron Nays, I'm throwing this to you first. What do you think? Uh, commission work on social media sh is should it be should it be etiquette or normal for the client to credit the photographer? Um, yeah, it seems like that might be case by case and relationship based. Like if if the photographer is able to talk with the client and <laughs> and have the client think that it's a good idea to mention the photographer's name in their personal Facebook page, yeah. right on, do it. Um, do it ahead of time, right? Like, hey. Yeah. By the way, it would be great if when you post these on Facebook, if you could mention Frederick Van. That would be awesome. But don't yeah. feel obligated or anything, but you know, most people do it. I'm just saying. Right? <laughs> exactly. Like if, just saying. if you can pull it off, go for it. Um, yeah. I don't think it's the responsibility of anyone to to you know to, to credit you, but if you see it on Facebook and you're are, you're you know close with the couple if it's a wedding portrait and be like, "Hey guys, you know, I saw you got a lot of awesome buzz. It's really, really exciting. You know, any possibility at all, you could like, you know, throw my name in there. I'd really appreciate it. I'm trying to build this business. So like, if you came out of like as a person and was like, I would really appreciate it if you did this, and they were like, cool, let's go for it. Yeah. But if you're like, where's where's my link? Why didn't you link to my work? You know what I mean? Then it's like. Especially in that voice. Right? Yeah. Then you got no right saying it. <laughs> I love it. All right, Don. Don, what about you? You know, you you let's say let's let's flip it on its edge. You're commissioned for some work, um, or no, no, that, that's what we just talk about. You you do some work for free. You know, you're out there and you're just shooting this event or whatever, and you you create a gallery and you say, hey, folks, here's shots from this gallery. Feel free to use them as you want, and you don't specify that you would like to be credited on social media, and they don't credit you. What what do you do, or do you care? At that point, I don't care. Uh, if I've agreed to do the work for free, um, and I have not thought beforehand to ask for that credit, you know that that then that's not my goal. Then my goal might simply be goodwill or to help somebody else out, and and not to uh, to promote myself. And so, in, in that case, I I wouldn't necessarily care so much. Um, if I was to be doing 
work for a corporate client, say I'm not doing pictures of people but I'm doing something else, whether it's architecture or products or anything like that, uh, then well, I wouldn't expect my name to be associated with that either. Uh, it's free for that particular client to do whatever they want with it without associating me with then their brand. Uh, and so again, it's a case by case basis uh, sort of experience. I don't do a lot of people photography, but if I did, uh, I might be inclined to include on uh, the CD or, or USB or, or however I get the files to the client a set of images for web use that might have my watermark on them. Uh, and I could say then if you're going to put them online, you don't have to credit me, but just use these ones so that my name is there. But you don't have to worry about anything else, just use these ones. I like that. Forethought, yeah, thinking yeah, ahead and saying, hey, these are these are images that I have specifically crafted for social media. Facebook likes them at this resolution, so use these, and they have your watermark. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I love that. That's brilliant. Perfect. All right, Martin, what about you? What do you think about this? So to credit or not to credit on social media? Well, what Don just said is exactly what I do. When I do any portrait work, I, I give them a, a folder of images that they can use for social media and their watermarks. Nice. Um, but I, I actually, for most of my portrait work, I, one of my main goals is to provide them with the prints as well. So I don't actually give them a, a CD of all of the selected images. I, I give them the social media um, images are, are the things that... I give them as their, that's their digital copy. And I also give them something that's just about big enough to, to do as uh, screenshot slideshows, things like that, and uh, to use on as their background. But the full-size images don't get handed off in my, in my portrait, um, you know, portraiture business model. But um, I, I'm a big believer in just getting everything agreed up front. And, it, and if, you, if you want people to credit you, then you have to stipulate that in, in a contract or agreement that you have. But if, if people go ahead and just use them without doing that, I'm not going to get all eaten up about it. I mean, I, I've been paid for the, for the job, and I would just hope that I hit, hit it out of the park, far enough out of the park that they want to tell people who shot the image. Um, you know, if, if they don't even think that you were important in, uh, an important enough part of the job for them to give you credit, then, you know... Then you got a branding that. and marketing problem at that point. <laughs> right. But, but like, like Aaron said, I mean, if, if you're just cool about it and say, hey, it looks like you're getting some, you know, it'd be really nice if you could just stick my name on there. Most people, if you approach them like that, they're just going to say, oh, yeah, sure, cool, just, just stick it on and you get, you get what you want. Um, but if you get all, all hung up about it and you just start to do the, <laughs> the Aaron voice, with the, you know, the, it's, it's not going to work. People, if, you, if you go into anything like that with that kind of attitude, people are not going to respond well. So just be cool about things and, and if, if you're human and sort of and decent, then most people will re respond in kind. I love it. And that, that's an excellent point. One of the nuances of what you said there is you have to ask for stuff. If you assume mm. that people are going to do stuff for you and then get pissed off because they didn't do it, mm. that's on you. But if you right. ask and then they don't do it, then, mm. okay, then you have kind of like a reason to not be happy. But mm. ask, you know, just say, put it out there and say, hey, these are some social media images that I created for you because mm. I know everyone wants to share this stuff online, so I made it easy for you. Please mm. share them and share these and credit me. You know, well, the, if you don't other, say that. The other side of it, of course, is that if you do go in with a negative attitude and say, hey, you should be doing this, and, and even if you have it in the contract and you say, you know, you need think these things to be credited when the images are, are displayed publicly, and you go in and say, that's in the contract, and I this you're supposed to do this and that, when that person gets asked who, who they had to shoot their images, are they going to think, oh, yeah, well, I'll, I'll just recommend that asshole that, <laughs> that is just been all negative to me? Or are they going to say, oh, yeah, well, that was some, that was some guy. He's, he's, a, he's a bit of a, you know, I, I was going to say dick, but I probably shouldn't. Um, <laughs> you, know, so, so, you can say that oh, with that accent. We uh, can't say that with an American. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, it's like uh, people, if you're negative with people, they, you, they're not going to re recommend you anyway. So just, just be nice and, and people will, will do the, the same. All right, love it. All right, guys, let's 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 jump through our pick of the week segment, uh, listeners. This is the segment where 
Our guests can pick anything to recommend to you as long as it is somehow related to photography. Um, Martin, I'm going to throw it at you first. What is your pick of the week? And Aaron, by the way, I know that you're on your iPhone and you may not have your computer in front of you. So I have a pick prepared for you, just in case you don't have one. So, okay. <laughs> and I'm going to let you go last, just in case you want to think one up. So Martin, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. So um, just in case this is, I'm going to just start this with a disclaimer, because I, with me traveling and everything, I haven't listened to the last few weeks of TWIP. So if someone's already mentioned this, I apologize. But um, while I was away and traveling, um, David Dusherman released his latest uh, ebook. It's a big book, so it's like 200 pages. Uh, the Visual Toolbox. It's 50 lessons for stronger photographs. It's amazing. Uh, and, yeah. and David hits it out of the park with all of his books. So uh, I've read probably the first 20 pages so far. So I can't say this on a having read the whole thing, but it's it's a great book again. It's just it's just one of those things that will remain in history. It's you know the, within the frame and. All of David's books, uh, photographically speaking, giving giving photographers around the world a vocabulary that we're we're sadly missing at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it's another it's another great book in that series. So if you haven't already checked out the Visual Toolbox, do so. It's brilliant. Love it, love it. Yeah, I I downloaded that, and I got to say, the Craft and Vision, I have most, if not all, of the Craft and Vision PDFs on my iPad Mini. And mm -hmm. I can easily say that those take up the most memory on my device <laughs> yeah. because you know they're the most important things on there. You know, I love it. You know, I use my iPad Mini as a book, as a e-reader, and they're perfect on there. So yeah, definitely highly recommended Craft and Vision eBooks and the Visual Toolbox, which is the latest one that I'm like you, Martin, halfway through. So mm -hmm. awesome. All right, Excellent. Don Komrechka, what's your pick of the week? Well, I'm in the process of building a new computer. And, uh, of course you, know, you are. Of course you Of are. course I am. <laughs> and so one of the things that, uh, that's been annoying me uh, in the last little while is my Lightroom catalog has been continuously getting slower and slower as my hundreds of thousands of images keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I was trying to find a way to speed things up. And, you know, faster processor, faster this and that, it all helps. But the biggest thing that really helps photographers these days, if you're, if you're looking to, to speed up your workflow at all, uh, picking up an SSD is a great option, a solid-state disk. Uh, so it's like a hard drive, but they're based on, uh, on just, you know, solid flash chips, like mm -hmm. your memory cards are. So they're a lot faster. Um, and I've got my Lightroom catalog on there. I've got my Photoshop uh, caching to this drive instead of a regular hard drive when I yes. run out of RAM and it speeds things up so much. Uh, it's, it, it might save me, uh, depending on what I'm doing, it could save me up to a half an hour to 40 minutes a day uh, of just time that I'd normally be waiting if I'm spending the whole time on the computer sorting through files, and, and that's worthwhile to a photographer. Uh, yeah. Samsung has come out with a new series of them. Uh, it's the 840 EVO, and uh, they've been doing these for a little while now. Um, the good thing about these is they're they're one of the top performing drives on the market, but they're also very affordable. You can get a 250 gigabyte drive for under 200 bucks now. The prices come down quite a bit on these guys. They have them all the way up to a terabyte in size. Uh, so if a photographer is looking at something to speed things up and and improve that uh, that workflow, uh, an SSD is a good option. I love it. You know, and I'll piggyback on that, uh, not to be a big Drobo fan, because I, I used to work there, actually, but I still use all this stuff. But the the Drobo Mini that I'm looking at uses SSD in it. So it does a RAID of four SSD drives. Right now, I can only afford two, so I only have two in there. Um, <laughs> but it does a RAID of SSD drives. But the cool thing is it's, it's Thunderbolt. So if you're a Mac user, it Thunderbolts into your computer, which gives these amazing almost like internal drive-like speeds, but with this external drive that's massive storage. So what that gives me, Don, is I can throw my Lightroom library on that thing and work from that without cluttering up, cluttering up my, uh, my MacBook Pro, which is connected here. So my little config here is a MacBook Pro 15-inch, a Thunderbolt display, cinema display, with the Drobo plugged in to the cinema display, and all my stuff is over there. You know, so it's... This sort of all works, and it's fast. Right. So you're absolutely right. The SSD. Oh, and the MacBook Pro is a is an SSD model, so it's got an SSD drive in there. So I'm speeding along. It's like, it's it's <laughs> faster than anything I've ever used. <laughs> Fre Frederick, I'm, I want to jump in and just say one thing there. Uh, you sure. know, I'm using the Drobo 5D, and that, and it's the same as the Mini. It's got the SSD accelerator at the bottom as well. 
Yes. Um, you can put the SSD accelerator in, and I've got um, just normal sort of hard drives in mine, but with that accelerator, it uses that for the read and writes. Uh, well, I'm not sure about the, the both ways, but it's it's lightning fast. Um, right. right. And I'm, that's I'm getting, as well, right? It's Thunderbolt as well, but the uh, so I mean I, I'm I'm really I would love a, one of these minis. I've been hankering after one since they came out. I've All got right. the 5D, um, but the uh, the mini is another one that you just put the SSD, um, the MSSD, I think it's called, in the bottom there, and it speeds them up like crazy. Yeah. So yeah, yep. that's. Yeah, great. I'm blown away by this thing. It's like, you know, it's one of those little pieces of hardware that makes you mad. It's like, why didn't I have this before? This is, yeah. <laughs> this is where all my stuff should have been stored. I'm wasting all this time with this <laughs> I.O., and now it just works the way it should work. So yeah. it's very cool. All right, Aaron, I've given you enough time to think of a pick of the week. Do you can have it one? Just be or a, yeah, can I do like a product? Yeah, you can do anything as long as it is even tangentially related to photography. All right on. Um... Well, I just got the. So you know, Joby, they make the gorilla pods and whatnot. Yeah. They just came out with a a small one that's magnetic, like it's a mini magnetic. It's I think it's called the G Pod Mini Magnetic or whatever. Um, and I just picked one up. Uh, you can you can put like a mount, so you can put like an iPhone or something like that on there. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's got like rare earth magnets on the bottom of each of the three on the bottom of the feet, and uh, so you can still wrap it around like tree limbs or something like that, but it. Is incredibly strong. Like it will stick to anything, uh, you know, any piece of steel or whatever you have around. So you cannot um, pull it off, right? I I think sixty percent of why I like it is just because I I'm a dude and I'm a dork and I like magnets. That's it right there. <laughs> <laughs> magnets are great. Magnets are great. Yeah. Put them in more things. <laughs> do not take a magnet and stick it on top of your hard drive, though. I just want to. Oh yeah. Don't yeah. Do that. Um, <laughs> Or but yeah, them. we we put a couple GoPros on some of these, and we put like iPhones on them because they have like an iPhone holder. And so when we're doing like behind the scenes video, we'll just snap. We'll put a couple book GoPros on these like mini magnetic things. Put them to like we have some I beams in our studio. You just like pop, 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 and hit go, and you're good to go. And they're just a lot of fun. I like, and they're pretty inexpensive. So like a a really good thing to have for like, you know, whatever forty, fifty bucks, whatever they cost. And they got magnets on them. Just and they're magnets. Come on. <laughs> you can't go wrong with a magnet. It, so, they're so, strong Aaron, magnets. They're it's really fun. <laughs> Aaron, Aaron, before before I get to my picks of the week, I wanna I wanna ask you what what is your normal workstation like when you are when you're sitting down and you're doing not so much the flirt episodes with the laptop and all that. Okay. But when you're when what you're I actually doing serious on. retouching, what are you using? Okay. Um. Well, I just picked up one of those new iMacs, the 27 inch. Oh, nice. Um. So I I. Basically, max that out with all the specs. I've got um, the big thing, the 32 gigs of RAM. That helps out a lot. Um, and then I've got a uh, like a Pegasus RAID array, uh, Thunderbolt Pegasus RAID array, and that, that thing's really fast. Um, nice. And then I've got like an external monitor and, and some other stuff. But um, as far as just performance goes, I mean, the 32 gigs of RAM helps out a lot. Uh and I, I got that all aftermarket, so it was really not that expensive. I think it was like two or three hundred bucks. Nice. And uh, you know, and then the 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 brand new computer or whatever, I, it's like three point five, three point two gigahertz. I I don't know the numbers too well. Just buy the new iMac and then click all the buttons to make it <laughs> more expensive. And then and add you'll the be RAM, happy. Yes. And then uh -oh. buy Photoshop. That that's what I did. Are you uh, are, are you considering getting that new Mac Pro? The new Darth Vader looking one? Um, not for me personally because I don't need it, but we have like video editing. Um, so like for them probably, but yeah. for me like I I just don't see much. The computer that I have is very very good. And yeah. I just don't need better. I really don't. Love it. Cool. All right, well, good. So we got the Gorilla Pod, and Don gave us SSDs from Samsung, and Martin gave us Craft and Vision. My pick of the week is free. It's DxO's Film Pack 3 is free until October 31st. The link to the free page where you can go grab it from will be in the the uh, the blog post for this episode. But if you're not fam familiar with DxO's Film Packs, basically they give you all these different film looks that you can load into Lightroom and Photoshop and, and just go to town. 
that's my first pick. My second pick is something that I just purchased a couple days ago, and that is a tutorial called Epic Burger. Are you familiar with that, Aaron, Epic Burger? <laughs> I'm familiar with that one, yeah. <laughs> so over on Flurn.com, Aaron's website, they just released a tutorial, one of their Flurn Pro tutorials called Epic Burger, with a bunch of behind-the-scenes footage of doing this sort of Dagwood-style uh, food shot, uh, taking multiple layers of a burger and in Photoshop bringing them together and... Aaron meticulously, in his meticulous kind of way, retouches them, retouches the burger to, you know, succulent perfection. So definitely go check that out. I think, what does it cost over on uh, Flurn.com? Is like twenty bucks or something? Yeah, I think right now it's a uh, twenty four ninety nine. Yeah, nothing. And you, what is it like, twenty five hours of footage or something? <laughs> it's yeah, it's like a full hour of like the actual photo shoot, and then I think it's two hours in addition to that of, like, editing and retouching and everything like that. So That's insane. So I, I put I put that stuff in the same category of craft and vision in terms of the level of quality that you guys are delivering to photographers and people that want to learn versus how much it costs. Is There's a there's a disconnect there because it's, like, craft and vision stuff is so cheap, but the value is, like, sky high, and you guys Flurn, at Flurn.com do the same thing. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And Thank you. I'm a customer. I bought it. So definitely check it out. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're at the end of the show, guys. Let's, uh, let's close this thing off. Martin, where can people go to connect with you? Oh, everything that I'm into is on martinbaileyphotography.com. So just go there and take a look at the menu, and you can get through to my workshops and uh, my portfolios and prints and everything. And my what's, blog, your, what's your next? What's your next workshop? What's uh? What's coming up? It's probably um the Sri Lanka. I was we were trying to do a Sri Lanka one, but we only gave ourselves a couple of months to to do it, and it's probably not going to happen. Um, if people are interested, there's there's a link there to that, and if if there's two or three people jumped up, it might still happen. Um, but uh, my next ones, my next planned ones are my winter tours in Japan, the Snow Monkeys and Hokkaido there. Um, we're in our eighth year with that now, and they yeah. just they just get better and better. Um, that's a dream to shoot the snow monkeys with Martin Bailey. Man, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, they're they're incredible. They're incredible. I, mean, uh, so. I know, right? Oh, yeah. I mean, have you yeah. seen these shots? I mean, I, I definitely want to go to that. That's so cool. Yeah. Now they're great. Um, we've we've almost filled tour two, and we've got a few spaces left on tour one still. So if you, if you're interested, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a great tour. So. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for coming on again. Not at all. All right, Mr. Don Komarechka, where can people go to connect with you? Best place to find me online is my website, doncom.ca. And uh, if you want to see where I'm most active and chat me up and uh, and have uh, you know responses because I'm very active and responding on Google+, then look for me there. Uh, and the links to that are all on my website as well. Love it. Cool. And last but not least is Mr. Aaron Nace. Again, thank you for coming on. It's your uh, your inaugural or with virginal episode. I don't know. That wouldn't work. So <laughs> your, your first your first time coming on Twip. You Welcome. You popped my Twip cherry tonight. <laughs> <laughs> to I think there might be a Flurn Pro in there somewhere. I think you. <laughs> I think so. All right. Where where would you like people to go to uh, to connect with you? Well. Uh, Flurn or phlearn.com. Uh, it's a pretty cool website. We have a lot of uh, free tutorials on Photoshop and photography, and we also have super advanced stuff if you guys are into advanced advanced things. Um, and on uh, Twitter, Instagram, all that stuff, I am A K N A C E R A K Nacer. And uh, yeah, I'm around. Cool. <laughs> all right. And Aaron, I would tack onto that. YouTube, because that's I think that's where I discovered you was on YouTube. You've yeah, got a ton a of free channel. tutorials up there, right? Yeah, over 500. Yeah, uh, Joe, just just tutorials. 500, just 500 tutorials online on Photoshop that people can consume. <laughs> I love it. Cool. All right, uh, that's it, guys. Listeners, if you want to keep up with everything in the TWIP universe, you can check us out at thisweekinphoto.com and remember to join our community. On Google Plus, we've got a vibrant and thriving community of photographers up there. And finally, if you're looking for me, Frederick Van Johnson, you can also find me on Google Plus. Just search for my name, Frederick Van, or you can find me at frederickvan.com. And with that, it is time to take that lens cap off. <laughs>